Okay, uh, good morning everybody. Um, our topic is legal and compliance aspects of IT security. Thought we'd start by introducing ourselves. Um, we're from Bon Pierce, uh, which is a commercial law firm uh, with a turnover approaching £50 million. We act for major UK businesses such as B&Q, Sainsbury's, English Heritage and the Crown Estate and we act also for a number of public sector organisations. And we provide legal support in areas such as commercial, corporate and real estate law and dispute resolution. As a result of the sort of work we do and the sort of people we act for, we have in our IT system sensitive information. So that can be information about the litigation that our clients might be involved with, or it might be information about the plans that they might have for disposing parts of their businesses. Um, and in, in addition to that, we have personal information on our systems about the 600 or so staff involved in the business. So in that context, IT security is clearly very important. And ensuring that the data on our systems remains confidential is commercially imperative. Paul McKay is uh, Bon Pierce's information security officer. Um, and under his guidance, Bond Pierce became the first law firm in the UK to obtain the ISO 27001 Information Security Management Standard. So just to briefly set out what we're going to go through, we're going to have a brief reminder of the legal framework which is relevant to IT security in the UK. And then we're going to have a, a, a little bit, a look in a bit more detail about how the legal fr framework will apply in practice considering some of the practical steps businesses need to take to ensure compliance with the legal requirements. I'm then going to look at a few points to look out for in the context of outsourcing, which is where I in particular get involved with this topic. And then I'll pass over to Paul, who will be able to explain to you some of Bon Pierce's experiences around IT security, and in particular our journey to obtaining ISO 27001. Okay, so to start with an overview of the legal framework, as has been mentioned, the key piece of legislation is the Data Protection Act. And the overarching principle behind the Act is that people should have the rights to know what information is held about them and to correct information that's wrong. And to achieve this, the Act obliges organisations to manage personal <coughs> information responsibly. There's plenty of other legislation in the area. So that includes the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations 2003, which supports the Data Protection Act by regulating the use of electronic communications for unsolicited marketing to individuals and organisations. As I'm sure you're all aware, the uh, Information Commissioner's officer of Office is the UK's independent authority and it's set up to uphold information rights in the public interest promoting openness by public bodies and data privacy for individuals. The Data Protection Act requires every data controller who's processing personal information in an automated form to make a notification to the ICO unless they are exempt. And the ICO also has a number of tools available to it for taking action to change the behaviour of organisations and individuals that collect, use and keep personal information. These include criminal prosecution, non-criminal enforcement and audit. And as is most frequently made aware, I think, the ICO has the power to serve a monetary penalty notice on a data controller. So the way the DPA works is that there are overarching um, principles which are set out. The key one for the purposes of today is principle seven, the security principle which requires that appropriate technical and organisational measures are taken against unauthorised or unlawful processing of personal data and against accidental loss or destruction of or damage to personal data. In practice, this means that organisations need to have appropriate security to prevent the personal data it holds being accidentally or deliberately compromised. And in particular, organisations need to design and organise security to fit the nature of the personal data it holds and the harm that may result from a security breach. Organisations need to be clear about who's responsible for ensuring information security. So have somebody like Paul on board. We need to make sure that the right physical and technical security is in place and that that's backed up by robust policies and procedures and appropriately trained staff. 
and we need to be ready to respond to any breach of security swiftly and effectively. So in practice, the way that that's achieved is that data controllers typically put in place policies, processes and training to help employees and contractors comply with their obligations under the security principle. The key sort of policies that we typically recommend are these that we've enumerated here. So a data protection policy will give clear instructions to employees as to what they need to do to comply with the DPA. An IT and internet use policy will include clear restrictions on employees' use of IT resources, such as restrictions on the use of removable media, requirements for encryption of remediable, removable media, restrictions on the use and transport of laptops, and prohibitions or limitations on the use of internet-based products used for the storage of personal data, such as cloud computing services for hosting documents and peer-to-peer -peer networking. A data retention and destruction policy uh, is required because the DPA requires personal data to be kept no longer than is necessary for the purpose for which it's collected. And although there's no universal retention period, the type of this type of policy can help employees assess the appropriate timescale in a given scenario. And finally, a data security breach management policy. Uh, it's just worth mentioning that there is an ICO good practice notice on this which provides useful guidance as to where to start on that. And then having put the, po the policies in place, the processes need to be established to back this up, to put it into practice. So you need IT and security controls. Uh, controls can be technical, such as access controls, password controls and so on. Or they can be physical, swipe cards, locked rooms, cabinets and clean desk practices. Access controls will mean, for example, that senior employees are likely to have better access to an organisation's information, including personal data, than a junior employee or the consultants may be granted restricted access to systems. Security level categorisation for personal data means considering the appropriate risk to be allocated to different types of data. So for example, <coughs> employee health records or appraisal records might be allocated a higher security rating than information about an employee's working hours. Security protocols, such as the means by which certain categories of personal data can or cannot be communicated or transferred and stored can be implemented. For example, it may be prohibited to send certain categories of personal data by email or to store that data on removable storage de devices such as USB sticks or, or disks. Oops, wrong way. No, right way. There we go. And finally, training. We were just saying at the break that um, actually it's all very well and good having the policies and processes in place, but what it typically comes down to is human error that causes a problem. And consequently, um, training is very important. And it's important to think about whether that needs to be extended not only to staff of an organisation, but also to people um, who might be involved in outsourced work which is what I want to just briefly touch on now. This is the area that I get involved in uh, data protection on. I'm a commercial contracts lawyer, and so I spend my, my days putting together business-to-business -to -business contracts. Um, so that can range from international agency agreements or um, contracts for goods, but also a lot of outsourcing services agreements. And in that context, um, data protection can be very important. Um, it's... it's the, the reason it's important is because liability re remains with the data controller. So, for example, if Bond Pierce outsources its uh, payroll services uh, and that there's a d data protection breach as a result, notwithstanding the fact that we may have done nothing wrong, it will still be us as data controller that's liable. Um, and the way to deal with that with third party providers is to look at appropriate levels of indemnity protection. So this is seeking to allocate the risk between the data controller and the data processor. As I say, at law, the liability will remain with the data controller, but insofar as there are financial uh, consequences arising as a result of a breach, it's helpful to have contractual remedies. So um, the level of those uh, indemnities is, is what causes discussion when putting the contracts together. Because although some of the... It, 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 as I say, it comes down to what the financial losses are going to be. And the direct losses um, that are likely to arise from a data security breach can be fairly clear. So that can be the, uh, the loss of a laptop. It can be the level of fine that's uh, imposed by the ICO. But beyond that, you need to think about the other, uh, other losses that might be involved. So, um, 
for example, a business might suffer a loss of reputation, damage to its reputation, and potentially loss of profits as a result of a data security breach. So if um, orders aren't coming in because people think you're not, safe, not a safe person to look after their data, that's an indirect loss that, if you're not careful, wouldn't be covered by a, um, an indemnity under a contract, and that's, that's an area to think about. Uh, and in the public sector, although potentially loss of profits, not so relevant, there will be other financial implications. So the fact that a data security breach might work against you when you're making applications for grants and so on in the future, you might want to think about how you might cover that off. So the, the temptation potentially is to, um, to have a blanket indemnity so that any losses that arise as a result of the data security breach are for the data processor and not for the data controller. The problem with that is that it tends to put up the prices and a data uh, processor will seek to um, charge more money if they are having a, an unlimited indemnity uh, cover in that way. So what we try to do is focus in on those areas of risk which are actually important to a client, those areas uh, where it's very hard to quantify the risks up front. So for example, there's potentially no need to have an uncapped liability indemnity in respect of responses to data, uh, data requests. Um, there's no need to have a, an un unlimited financial uh, indemnity protection in place there. But there might be other areas, as I say, where it's harder to quantify uh, the level of uh, loss involved where an unlimited indemnity might be more appropriate. What you do in an ideal world, though, is ensure that such losses don't arise. And so it's important when putting in place the contracts to think about the levels of system security that you want to comp your data processor to comply with. That can be done in a shorthand way by uh, providing that your data processor will sign up to your organization's data protection policy. The alternative is to spell out in detail in the contract what level of data security provision you expect your data controller to be providing. Um, I'm going to pass over to Paul, uh, who is going to give you a few more details about Bon Pierce's IT. As Laura said, my name is Paul McKay. Um, I'm the Information Security Officer at Bon Pierce. Um, I actually have a split role. I'm also a network analyst at Bon Pierce, so I do sit within the IT department. Um, as Laura said, we were the first UK law firm to achieve 27,001 across our entire organisation. Uh, there were three other law firms before us that achieved certification. Um, however, it was purely for either their electronic document management system or for one department within the organisation. Uh, which kind of devalues from the certificate in my uh, opinion uh, and that is my own opinion uh, and it's a little bit ingenuous of those other companies to say that they're 27,001 certified if it is purely for a document management system or little Johnny sat in the corner twiddling his thumbs not doing anything. So in terms of compliance um, my section of today's discussion will talk and touch on how Bond Pierce actually ensures compliance with IT security. As I say, 27,000. Hopefully all of you in the room have heard of ISO 27,000 um, and prior to that obviously it was a British standard. So why did Bon Pierce decide to go down the ISO 27,000 route? Well, it's internationally recognised, it's a global standard and it actually gives confidence to our clients. There are two main parts to 27,001. One is the certification side, which is 27,001, which is the only part that you can be certified for, and 27,002, which is the technical processes behind that. So all of the controllers and everything that you must do in order to satisfy you to achieve that standard. The 135 controllers within the standard, not all of them will apply to your particular business. That said, you cannot say as your statement of applicability that none of the controls are applicable, can I be certified please? It doesn't quite work that way. It's become a popular standard for several reasons. As I say, it's global, it's recognised internationally. It's flexible, because the controls are there. As I say, not all of them will apply to your particular organisation or business. You can actually opt to make them not applicable to your organisation. However, they will be scrutinised and you will need to justify those reasons. It's independently audited, so we conduct internal audits, but because we hold the certificate, we also get regularly audited by BSI in our case. Because of the size of our organisation, 
and the number of users and staff that we have, they actually conduct audit audits every six months. So we're actually a, a diverse company um, global, uh, globally in the UK. So we have five UK offices ranging from Aberdeen to here in Plymouth. It gives clients assurance. One of the driving factors why Bon Pierce decided to go down 27,000 rate was more and more RFPs and tenders that we receive have information security questions in them. So it's good for the clients to know that we get audited and that, as I say, gives the assurance. One of the best tenders I've seen in the last three, four years was from a client who actually listed all 135 controls of the standard as questions as part of their RFP. There was no thought process whatsoever that went into it. Ensures you are thinking about information risk, uh, and as Jeremy said in his discussion, risk assessment is key. You have to do the risk assessment from that, you'll get a risk treatment plan. Some risks you'll actually be happy to accept. You can live with certain risks, whether it be a BYOD process or whether it be a certain piece of technology that you use. It's about the process and not the technology. So policies that you put in place to mitigate those risks. It's important when you formulate your policies that you actually use correct wording in policies. A policy should not contain the word should. A user should do something. The word should leads to an element of interpretation. And people from that standpoint can actually get out of being adhering, adhering to that policy because of the word should. So you should use the word must or shall. And you saw from one of the slides that Laura put up around principle seven, that you shall put in the necessary technology processes in place in order to satisfactorily protect the data that you hold. So the 27,000 sections then, as you can see there are a broad scope of sections. Sorry, yes? Um, policies, there are probably two sets of documentation that you need in terms of IT security. One is the policy aspect, where that's quite prescriptive, um, but then there are inevitably going to be some guidance notes as well. Yeah, so. Yeah, so it depends upon the organisation and the industry that they're in. So from a legal aspect, being a, a law firm, we always use shall and must um, because of the legal terminology. Um, and all of our policies that we get written, we actually get our lawyers to actually go through those policies to make sure that we're not being unreasonable in what we're asking for and to make sure it complies with the law as well. So as you can see, there are several sections within the standard ranging from the risk assessment and the treatment process right at the beginning, which as I say is key. The security policy is not your underlying policies that you put into place, but your security policy generally from a 27,000 perspective should be no more on the page, which surprises people. When I speak to other people and I say, have you got a security policy? And they say yes, and they produce binders of documents. That's not their overarching security policy. Organisational security, whether it be internal to your organisation or to external. As Laura mentioned, she deals with a lot of outsourcing components of her day-to-day -day work. So ensuring that there are legal binding contracts in place to do with outsourcing. Asset management. So Jeremy's discussion around BYOD is quite interesting because that's ensuring you know what assets you have from an information perspective. Where is the information and data that you hold? If you allow a BYOD culture, can you be guaranteed that that data is secure? Human resources, also a key department in any policy that you write. Ideally, they should also have input because they're the ones that should be enforcing your policies down the dis disciplinary route. Physical and environmental, so ensuring that secure areas remain secure with restricted access to a limited number of people. Environmental, obviously there are WE regs and various other compliance issues within the UK that you need to adhere to. Communications and operations, again communication within the organisation is key and making sure that all of your users are not only aware that the policy exists but what is in the policy. So training and education is also key. 
access control, ensuring that people have access to the information that they need and no more or no less. So that can be a very difficult one to balance. Information systems acquisition, development and maintenance. If you do any in-house development, make sure that that's not on a live system. Make sure that it's on a test environment, model office, and that you can actually produce input and output results. Information security incident management. As Jeremy said with the BYOD, it's key to ensure that you have particular incident responses dependent upon what the breach or the information security um, incident might be. They don't all follow the same rule. Business continuity management is a section in its own right within 27,000. However, recently BS 25.9 did become an ISO in its own right as well. Within 27,000, I think there's probably about six or seven controls around business continuity. So they're quite brief. And compliance. So that's not just with a standard that you might sign up to, but it's also the Data Protection Act, the Computer Misuse Act, and various other legal and regulatory acts and bodies that are out there. Obviously, from a legal standpoint, working for a law firm, the Data Protection Act, as Laura has already alluded to, is one of the key ones that we need to sign up to. As an example, personal information of somebody's CV, you're only allowed to keep somebody's CV electronically or paper-based for a maximum of 12 months. So if you have a document management system and you keep those CVs in your DMS, but your DMS retention policy is forever, you could be in breach of the DPA. That judgment has actually come from the ICO, uh, so the Information Commissioner Office, um, and it, part of the principles of, of the DPA is that the data that you collect will be for as long as deemed necessary. It's felt by the ICO that somebody's CV, because of the amount of work that they might change or go through in their skill and expertise, is actually out of date within a 12 month period, therefore it's no longer necessary to keep that CV, and that's kind of where it stems from. So, there are plenty of ISO standards, ranging from 9001 to quality, 27000 information security, 14000 which is the environmental one, and 22301 which is the business continuity one. It's not yet known how many companies have achieved the business continuity one, but we do know that Intel Bank in Spain were the first. And as you can see from those standards, quality seems to far outweigh any other standard. It's the most adopted standard globally. The information security one, there's only 7,800 worldwide certifications in effect at the moment. More than half of those are in Japan. And a lot more than half of those are in Japan. So it's not just legal firms, that's across the board. So I think we should thank Laura and Matt for the presentation.